And we'll go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sanctuary's Zoom church service. I'm David, one of the staff. Uh, just want to give a shout out to the comet Neowise that is now visible in the night sky in the Northern Hemisphere. Anyone seen it yet? You can comment if you have. It is uh, Neowise, one of the brightest comets to visit us in decades, even though it's about 60 million miles away. Uh, a few days ago, I stood and watched it on uh, top of a bluff near Lake Michigan. And I was watching it through some binoculars uh, for a moment. I was completely lost in the vastness of our universe and the wonder of a large ball of dust and ice zipping past us around our solar system at 18,000 miles per hour. Even the mosquitoes sucking a good amount of blood from my hands couldn't distract me from the view. It was fantastic. There's still time to catch the comet, by the way. You can see it in the evening. Um, Google it if you want, and it won't be around long. The next time it comes to Earth will be in about 6,800 years. So catch it while you can. Uh, that is also a time frame that Jesus might call soon. So there you have it. Comment in your eyes. Recommend it. Let me read our welcoming statement. We at Sanctuary are a community that makes space for every race, ethnicity, age, orientation, and gender identity. We welcome belief and doubt, devotion and exploration, while hoping to connect with God, one another, and our world as we do life together. If you're a guest or visitor, we're uh, glad to welcome you to our online virtual service. We'd love to get to know you if you're just joining us, and you can help us by filling out a very brief welcome card. That is at our website at sanctuaryic.org slash welcome. Let me highlight a few things going around uh, on, at or near Sanctuary. Um, first, we are hosting a blood drive at Sanctuary. It is on Wednesday, July 29th. You can sign up online at the site you can see on your screen. Uh, we are following very safe protocol for this event. So you can see all the details, um, including while well, we'll have masks that are required and all the folks, their staff will have PPE. Um, there's currently a shortage of blood at our local hospitals. And so that's, we can do our part and so please consider signing up. Again, that's July 29th. Uh, second, there's a new small group that my wife, Allie and I are hosting called Slice of Life. We have two more sessions. The first was really fun. We actually went back through our calendars and social media since the pandemic began and just took some time to reflect on what we were noticing from our lives in the past few months and shared some stories around that. So we have some exciting plans for the next two sessions. Email me if you'd like to sign up for that. And then finally, we have a couples seminar launching this week, a part one for those who have not done the virtual version and a part two for those who did do the virtual part one. Um, these are really, really fantastic opportunities. It's open to any couples, married or unmarried. Uh, just take the opportunity. Some really great uh, handles on relationships and some fun exercises, meaningful exercises to be with your partner as a couple. Um, so I highly recommend it. Go to our website, uh, sanctuaryic.org slash couples for all the information. All right, we're going to turn now to our senior pastor, A.D. Wasink, for another announcement. A.D. Morning, everybody. When David said he was excited about something, I didn't think he was going to say the comet. I thought he was going to say my haircut. So I was really surprised when it was just like, oh, a comet. Um, Fair. <laughs> um, all of you know Beth. Fega. Beth has been on our staff now um, for several years, um, but because of the pandemic that we find ourselves in, Beth's job description has changed dramatically, and so much of what Beth has loved to do and we've loved to have her do over the years, um, which includes planning and executing events, hosting, meeting, greeting, organizing groups, and so on, hasn't been possible these past months. And so as a result, Beth has decided to step down for now from her staff position. 
Um, and while we're super sad, I'm super sad um, uh, about that, Beth isn't going anywhere. They're not leaving and she'll still be an active um, part of our community. So let me just say, I hate COVID and I love Beth. Um, so Jesus, we're so grateful for all the ways that Beth has served at Sanctuary. So grateful for all the ways she's loved and loves so many of us. We're so grateful for what she does. We're so grateful, Lord, for who she is. And we ask that you would bless Beth, that you'd fill her with your endless love and joy in this season. Amen. Thank you, Beth. Love you. While I'm mentioning COVID-related changes, I also wanted to acknowledge that our staff continues to hear lots of stories from folks in the congregation who are facing all kinds of challenges and difficulties, which is not surprising. Life is hard without COVID and it's really challenging now. If you are one of those um, people or families who are struggling in some way, please um, let us know. Um, in particular, we know that there's many, many, many families who are facing challenges as we look toward this coming school year with COVID surging in our communities and uncertainty around how classes are gonna be offered in the fall. We know that stresses are heightened. So please, please reach out to one another, reach out to us, Maybe there are ways that we can help. Um, Jesus, we cry out to you. Oh God, Spirit of God, show us the way to love and to support one another through this season of loss, of change, of uncertainty. Be with all of us, oh God. Help us all to be aware of your presence. And I'm thinking of our families with young children. I'm thinking of our teachers, librarians, administrators, resource people, those who I'm forgetting to name, our kids. We just say, come Lord Jesus, come. Fill us and show us the way, oh God. Amen. We'll turn now to Liana, our kids uh, ministry director for her update this week. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on the Kids Wing blog today, you'll find the next topic in our Summer of Wonder series, which is the sun. Um, there are some really fun art and science activities that you can do using the sun plus stories, scripture, songs, and videos. So check that out. And this week, don't forget, if you ordered a book through our Get a Book, Give a Book campaign, make sure to come to Sanctuary to pick it up on Tuesday or Thursday between 4 and 6 p.m. Uh, make sure to wear a mask when you come, and I'll be wearing my mask too. Side note, there are a few books that have not yet arrived, and I have emailed those people whose books are not in yet. So make sure you check your email before you head out. Um, and I will let you know when your books do come in. Also, if you ordered a Summer of Wonder activity packet for your child, you'll be picking those up at the same time. So Tuesday or Thursday of this week from four to 6 p.m. at Sanctuary, wear a mask. And we also have 10 extra of these packets. So if you didn't order one and you want one for your kid, um, it's first come first, first serve. So come early before they're gone. Um, we just miss you all. And we hope that you love these gifts and we can't wait to get them to you. So all of us at Sanctuary, hope you love them and we'll see you on Tuesday or Thursday to pick those up. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, Leanna. Yes. A rare opportunity to come visit us at the building. Woo woo. Um, so yes, check your email everyone for that, for the update. Um, okay, we're going to transition now before our first song in the teaching from Tom. We have a guest speaker this morning, 
Uh, we usually get to hear from James Tutson, one of our regular preachers, but this morning we will welcome Steph Tutson. Um, we're so excited to have Steph. It, we asked her to share a little bit from her perspective on race and racial issues. So um, happy to have you, Steph. Take it away. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so like David said, my name is Steph Tutson, better known as the wife of James Tutson, which I'm okay with. Um, and yeah, AD asked me a couple weeks ago if I had any words I would like to share about what life has been like for me as a white mom of um, biracial kids married to a black man. And um, there's a lot to be said. And my kids are really young. Etta, um, my daughter, is three, and Haven, my son, is eight months. So this is all really new to me. But with that being said, I do feel like my perspective has changed a lot in the past couple months. So a little background on me. I grew up loving Black culture and um, have been a self-proclaimed, not racist, from a liberal family who loved the Obamas and worshipped Beyonce for as long as I can remember. And to be honest, when me and James got married seven years ago, I thought that that was enough. I thought that it was up to him and his family to get to know me um, and that everything I did should be held under the assumption that I am not racist. But fast forward seven years and that idea has finally been disrupted. So um, a couple months ago after the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, like a lot of white people, um, my perspective just started to feel not good enough. It started to feel not good enough um, to just be a pro proclaimed not racist um, or to just be nice to James's family um, or to just try to be a good mom. And I started to wonder, um, do they know I really care about what's happening? Do they know that I love their blackness? And it's been one of the greatest joys in my life to be a part of a black family. Do they see me as someone that would fight for them? And do they think I take the role of raising our biracial kids lightly? So the other day, a friend of ours, Kelsey, came over to respectfully social distance on her screened in porch. And she was sitting across from me and my daughter, Etta. And Etta was sitting in my lap and she asked Kelsey, what color are your nails painted? And they were painted a sparkly, sheer, pale taupe color, what most white people, including myself, refer to as nude. So Etta asked Kelsey this. And Kelsey took a two second pause and she started using descriptor words to describe what color her nails were painted using every word she could think of besides nude. And Etta smiled and listened, but the moment wasn't lost on me or Kelsey. And the thing I get most about my kids um, is how cute they are, which they are. <laughs> um, but that's really not enough for me to feel like someone has my kids back. And Kelsey's extra moment of thoughtfulness meant a lot to me and meant a lot to Etta. And in that moment, I knew that Kelsey really loved Etta because Kelsey was willing to change for Etta. And I want to be like Kelsey. I won't have control over a lot of what my kids experience. Um, but I do have control over the type of mom I will be. And I want my kids to see me taking that extra step, trying to get it right, and um, being willing to change, to take a two second pause before I speak, um, and to not rest on just assuming that they know I'm surely not a racist um, because I'm their mom. And I'm realizing that every choice I make in parenting 
um, can be a racist choice or an anti-racist choice. So this disruption to my internal status quo um, has reminded me of some similarities in my faith journey as well. A lot of times um, I'll feel like I've arrived or know things about God, um, and then I'll be swiftly turned upside down by the Holy Spirit. And I'm always surprised when these internal disruptions um, actually feel like they lead to what is more freedom and more depth in my faith. It's really uncomfortable for me um, to have my worldview shifted and it definitely hurts my pride. Um, but when I manage to lean in just even a little bit, I can feel God making me more new and more free. So for me, and this is just me, this might all be irrelevant in a couple of years in my parenting, but these are three things I'm committing to right now. Um, as a white mom with black kids, black friends, and black family, um, to honor them and actively love them. Number one is to get humble, which for me means to simply humble myself to the fact that there is still work to be done in me specifically. Um, and number two is to do the work. So I can get really self-congratulatory um, or comfortable when I feel like I've uncovered a new reality of racism within myself or within the world around me um, or people around me, but I need to keep on pulling back those layers. And number three is to say something. So instead of relying on the assumption that everyone thinks I am not a racist, to take a two second pause and like Kelsey, fight to get it right. Um, even, even in those seemingly small moments. And really what I'm hoping this all amounts to is that I want my kids to watch me do this. I want them to watch me try to get it right, to work at it every day. And I'm learning that accepting or appreciating their blackness isn't enough. Um, to truly love them, I need to fight for them and be willing to change for them and fight to get it right. So that's all I have, but I would love to connect with anyone else that's thinking about these things, um, especially anyone from multiracial families. But yeah, thanks for letting me share you guys. Thank you, staff. We so appreciate that. Um, yeah, I just, I, I personally really resonate with everything you're naming and resonate with the approach of humility, willingness to learn and having kind of, I, I feel like I've had, continue to have my own world and perspective turned upside down again and again. Um, and that's, that's what we're asking all of us, surely, is that we would all be teachable to lean into um, what God has for us. So thank you, Seth. That's great. Um, okay, we're going to transition now to a song and then to the teaching from Tom. Um, our first song is from Corey and, and JJ, two of our regular worship leaders. I do want to let you know that these songs were recorded on a porch, screen porch, while it was raining. So you may hear some rain in the background. That's kind of the white noise factor. Um, but it does not disrupt the feel and the beauty of the song. So, but just want you to know that's, that's the sound you'll hear, the lovely rain. So we'll go from there. I lift my eyes.
Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we live in a time right now of multi-layered threat, strife, and chaos. And the question for the morning is, how does Jesus help? How does God through Jesus help? Now, one whole domain of help that we focus on a lot is God through Jesus reveals us to ourselves. So God has a pretty deep understanding of human nature, both us as individuals and then how we, when we come together as groups, how do we behave? So God perceives the kinds of things that we do as groups of people to make ourselves powerful at the, at the expense of others, to erect systems um, that benefit some to the detriment and harm of others. And so by paying attention to Jesus, to how Jesus behaves, what Jesus says and does, as Jesus interacts with systems, we can perceive ourselves in those settings and understand what we need to do to contend with those systems, systems of injustice. So God reveals us to ourselves through Jesus. But then there's a whole other way, I think, that in the midst of threat, strife, and chaos, God through Jesus helps, and that's by revealing God to us. And not even things about God, not understandings of God, not the nature of God, but just God in Jesus, the Godness of Jesus. That if we're able to perceive that and maybe comprehend that, we can do better than we would otherwise in the midst of the world as it is. So we're gonna look at a story where that happens in a pretty remarkable way, a story of pretty intense threat, strife, contentiousness, chaos, at the end of which is a remarkable exclamation of a perceiving of God in Jesus. So it's one of the more well-known stories about Jesus. It's his crucifixion. I'm gonna read some excerpts from the story uh, that come from the account as told by Mark. And what I want you to pay attention to is just the very last exclamation at the end of the story. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the, change of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the religious leaders mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this anointed one. This king of Israel come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So I kind of wish I'd been able to go home with that centurion for dinner. You know, I'm assuming he had a family. For him, it would have been probably kind of a normal work day. This is what he does. He enforces the will of the empire 
which involves putting down those who resist, those who rise up, those who rebel. <laughs> but <laughs> when he gets home this night, uh, I'm presuming he has a family. His wife asks him, so honey, how was work today? And he says, well, I think we just killed God, right? And it's a remarkable twist of perspective for this man. The whole scene, right, up until that moment has been, again, probably pretty stereotypical, but filled with threat, strife, and chaos, all of which are the center of gravity for everybody. That's what everybody is focused on. You have empire suppressing, subjugating uh, a particular people group. That people group have all sorts of responses to the subjugation. Some of them are conciliatory. They kind of keep their heads low. Others want to rise up and cast it off. So there's strife amongst them. There's threat all around. Everybody lives under threat. And then you have this event where one of them, as happens from time to time, rises up, tries to resist threat, and power does what power does. They apprehend, they humiliate, they put to death. And so everybody, no matter what your perspective from within that group would have been on Jesus, would have gotten the message loud and clear, a message of subjugation, terror, humiliation, the placard is there. This is the king of the Jews, and this is what we do to your king, right? So through and through, the focus for everybody there, the center of gravity, the foundation, is threat, power, domination, strife, chaos. But then something happens for this man. Right again, this probably would have been an ordinary day for him. We have the account that says all the soldiers were gathered in the mocking of Jesus. So this guy probably was there participating in the activity of humiliating. And then Jesus is executed. The execution is pretty run of the mill. He actually doesn't live as long as most people. So nothing too remarkable there. He dies like all the rest. But something in his dying right? This is before the resurrection. This is before big, powerful things. This guy has not witnessed anything. He has not heard the reports from the friends of Jesus, you know, where Jesus has said to them, it's going to be bad, but just wait. To him, Jesus is dead. He's not coming back to life. But somehow in the dying of Jesus, the godness comes through and everything changes. The meaning of everything changes. The center of it is the godness of Jesus. And what's remarkable too is we don't know why this man had this perception. We don't know what he saw. In the account in Mark, uh, it says, seeing how he died, the centurion says, surely this was the son of God. But there's a little note in my translation that says, some translations have seeing how or hearing how he cried out. So the exclamation maybe. If you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew says there was an earthquake and dead people rose from the graves. And then the centurion said, oh, surely this was the son of God. Right? The thing is, in the end, we don't know because nobody asked him. No, nobody went up to him and said, hey, you said something kind of strange at the foot of the cross. What was it that you saw or perceived? So I don't know. Somehow in dying, in how he died, the godness of Jesus comes through and changes everything. It's not that all the other stuff wasn't happening anymore. It's just the frame of reference, the starting point, the foundation. And whatever it was that happened there, I want that. I want that perceiving of Jesus for me. I want that comprehending of Jesus for me. It's a thing that happens not infrequently in the life of Jesus, right? One of the most well-known stories too is Jesus is traveling on a boat uh, across a lake with his friends. A squall comes up, threatens to capsize the boat. The, the friends are freaked out. They wake up, Jesus, aren't you worried we're gonna drown? Jesus calms the wind and the waves. 
And the friends don't say, oh, thank you, or how did you do that? But who is this man, right? All of a sudden, that's the question, that's the frame, that's the center, that's the thing from which all else comes. I think this is why, at least in part, I keep going to my spiritual director, because it feels like it's kind of, it's his life's pursuit right now, is to continue perceiving and comprehending God in Jesus, so that when I come to him with my storms, <laughs> he's kind. He can be empathetic. He's not wrapped up in or having as the starting point chaos, threat, stress, stress, crisis. The starting point for him is Jesus. And so he can hear me and be kind and know me and say smart things to me that are helpful, that bring calmness to me. I've experienced this myself. Uh, in, in a number of different ways through prayer practices, I often experience it through nature dramatic nature experiences. I was out there looking at the comet in the sky and there's something, everything else goes on in the world, but I see this thing that is outside that has been going for millions of years. That's not going to come back for 6,800 more. And it, it gives me a different centering place. Right. And I feel the difference in the way that I behave in the world. So a part of my prayer practice every morning is to try to perceive Jesus, to try to comprehend Godness in Jesus. And I think it makes a big difference for the people in my life when I do, right? Because <laughs> everybody is stressed right now. All conversations have about 10 times the normal quantity of stressfulness to them <laughs> than they did six months ago. And I bring that. So if the center of gravity for me is threat, strife, chaos. That's where things begin. That's what we do. That's what we focus on. Ah. If the center for, of gravity for me, if I've been able to perceive Jesus in my morning prayer practice and comprehend him, when I encounter the sense of threat from others, I'm able to be more empathetic. I'm able to be more incisive in my responses, more perceptive. Um, I think they feel better. I think I feel better, right? And Jesus wants this place. Jesus is happy to be the center of gravity for all of us. He is happy to make himself known, to be perceived, to be comprehended, because I think it can really help us, right? We're in the midst of things that aren't going away tomorrow. We need to take advantage of the godness in Jesus just as a thing to be perceived. So I'm going to pray briefly and just let us see if we can have any little taste of that, settle into that um, before we continue on with the rest of our morning together. So Jesus, you carry God within you. <laughs> it's so remarkable right, that within you is God. I think for us, if we just perceive that, if we just comprehend that, not even what it means or the attributes of it, but just that, that God is in you, we can be helped. So give us a little taste in whatever way might come to us this morning of that Jesus, an ability to comprehend God in you. Thank you that you are close, Jesus, that you're not far off, that you bring you and God in you to us in so many ways. Amen. 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 Thanks, Tom. Um, we're going to transition right away to two songs in response, uh, again, both from Corey and JJ. We'll share the song and the lyrics. All this pain, I wonder if I'll ever find my way, I wonder if my life could be. 
really change at all. All this earth, good all that is lost ever be found, could a burning come up from this ground. You make beautiful things 
Thank you all for spending the time this morning with us. Thanks to everybody who participates, who contributes. We're just grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your attention, for your continued being with us. We really hope that this time together on Sunday morning like this can be a little bit of that Jesus center of gravity in our world, right? That what we say and do and what we sing and share and just our presence with us with kind of us all together can be that thing that is what grounds us what orients us towards god as the beginning as the foundation as that from which meaning is made so let me pray in closing jesus i thank you for this community of people that we're with each other as we go through the multiple levels of threat strife, chaos in our world. Jesus, that we have the possibility of perceiving you, we have the possibility of comprehending you, of oh, just of being oriented. Oh, look at, there's God. Amen. Wow. Um, I pray we'd all have a taste of that today, a taste of that this week, that we'd experience the helpfulness of that together. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, really, really good to be together. That concludes our service this morning. Um, I do want to mention next Sunday, we are planning a live full band that will be playing socially distanced and masked at Sanctuary, except for the singers. Um, so you can, you can expect to see that next week on Zoom or Facebook Live, a full band at Sanctuary. And we'll, we'll rock it out like we used to do. Um, so that'll be fun. All right. Great to see y'all. We'll go ahead and unmute and, uh,